We're going to talk about putting the cam gear on, on the cam, and degreeing the cam in relationship to the crank. We've already okay. covered deck heights, but there was something we forgot to tell to, uh, everybody about deck heights, didn't we? Well, about we'll, we'll show it. Piston. Yeah, in the in the midst of your deck height, you should mark each piston so that you know where it's going to go in later on. You know, you don't. You've you've gone to the trouble to make specific changes. You want it to be put back in that place again, okay? This particular cam and cam gear, this is a straight cut gear against the, the yeah, double cut here, gear. Here are the difference. There's the straight cut and of course the normal uh, radial cut there. Yeah, okay, the difference here, this one's nice and quiet. In this particular engine, it's gonna have a lot of valve spring, a lot of lift. It's gonna try to push that bevel gear forward and backward in the case, which is going to wear this thrust bearing out. This cam gear won't do that. It's going to be just, it's going to be just straight running off the, the crank gear. Okay, we're going to install this first off in a straight up position on the cam. Just the way the cam grinder designed it to be. Tell them the difference in the washer. Okay. There's three different washers that selectively go into these three recesses in the cam. One advances it, one retards it, and one is straight up. In other words, the cam is not in an advanced or retarded state. Now we're going to bolt this together here. for degreeing this in the first place is that we want to make sure it's right. It could be as much as four or five degrees off of what the cam grinder intended it to be. And we're building this engine to such close tolerances, we want to be able to retain everything that's to our advantage. And drop it in there on its marks. Bring it down now. When you put the cam in like that, there should be clearance between these two gears. It's easy enough to check. The gear should rock a little bit. You can just about here, and I'll bend down here. That's perfect. What you want to do is to check it in more than just one place. Rotate the engine around every couple of teeth on the gear and check it. And keep Keep rotating it, never just assume it's right in one place. Take it all the way around and check it. When you're satisfied that it's right, then go ahead and leave it there. You should also, for your final check, torque the case halves together. Yeah, the, it will the ultimate test is with the case halves torqued together. In this case here, we're just going to check it so that when we put the case halves together, we don't put it in a bind and find out we're in trouble. So what we're going to do here, we're going to take the other case half and put some lifters in it. Up here. We've already checked that the lifter's clear in the case. <coughs> By the way, these are the handiest things anybody ever came up with for putting lifters in. When you're sliding the case halves on, Nothing more aggravating, especially when you're setting an engine up, you don't want to be greasing everything up. 
You yeah. can just put them in there and it holds them up. Yeah. They're just clip springs and they're available for most all of the mail order uh, houses. Um, and many local parts stores yeah. have them too. They're lifter holders, just um, opposite springs. And they're very, very, very handy. They make life bear bearable. We're going to torque this together, or pull it up tight, it doesn't have to be torqued together. We're going to install our dial indicator, and our degree wheel on the front, and our pointer. Pointer is very handy, it can be made out of a piece of wire, even. They'll hold that up and show it to them. This is one we've made for using when we assemble an engine, where it goes, hold it down here. Also, make sure you put the Woodruff key in. We tried it one night without that, it didn't work. It's kind of hard to decide where to put it. And you're using a forged pulley here. Yeah, that's... Sand, sand seal type pulley. This is just for your That's degree. just for degreeing. I use yeah. that in here because I know it's consistent. Yeah. I know I, I, can, I can give a motor away and I know that it was right off this pulley. Yeah, you use the same pulley over and over. Just, yeah. Just standard. Line it up on the Woodruff key. Got the pulley on the on the motor with the Woodruff key. We've installed a little indicator here that that lets us see exactly where the center of the case half is, so that we don't got to try to line it up down the center. Okay, we're going to turn the thing over now. I'm, I'm going to go through one revolution. Hang on them rods so they don't bang around. You can see here, it's come back to zero. Make your move. Turn them up. One minute. Okay, now here we go. We're going to start watching the indicator come up, starting off zero. And it's going to come up to 50 thousandths. We're going to get the 50 thousandths, and then we're going to check on the pulley in relationship to the pointer we've got and for the cam to be set straight up it should be 36 degrees what do you see there Bill we have 34 degrees 34 degrees so it's two degrees retarded right now we'll crank it through the rest of the cycle and count the number of revolutions we've already gone by one two three Four sixteen. Okay, that's what the card says it should have is four sixteen. That's the total lift at the cam. And later on we'll go through, we'll show you what the cam has for lift against what it gets multiplied in the yeah, rocker arm. The rock. In this particular one, it's going to multiply it up to six hundred and twenty thousandths total lift at the valve. Okay, but we'll, we'll get into ratio rockers a little bit later. Okay, we're going to come back down again. And when we get to 50 thousandths again, we're going to check where the pointer is in relationship to the degree wheel to see if the valve is closing at the right time. 68 degrees. 68 degrees. So we're still two degrees off. So the cam is... The cam is right on. We can bring that retarded situation into exactly what we want with these offset washers. It can go right in the end of the cam. That will point to it. And put the cam gear in a little different place on the cam in order to make the cam timing be as that card says it should be. On, a, on an engine like this, because it's such a high performance cam and it's already got the cam is designed to do what the grinder wanted it to do. I suggest setting it like the card says. Don't try to outguess these guys. They've been doing a lot longer than we have. So, we'll go back down to zero again. And we'll take it apart. We'll 
put a different washer in it and bring it up so that it's right what the card says. We'll take it apart here in a little bit and, and do that. The, the next thing we're going to do here, the, we've degreed the cam. Mm -hmm. Okay, We know the cam is where we want it and, and, and it, as far as advance or retard. Mm -hmm. and, and in most cases, I like to put a cam straight up. You know, it comes with a card like this from the cam manufacturer. It tells you what the cam is degreed at, where the intake valve opens, where it closes in degrees in relationship to the crankshaft, where the exhaust valve opens and closes in relationship to the cam, and to the crank. And it tells the lift at the valve, and on the opposite side, it'll tell the lift at the cam. Mm -hmm. So we're going to use these numbers now to determine correct rocker arm geometry. And most cam manufacturers will, uh, will give you that information that, that or you cam, should ask for it. You should ask for it or most reputable cam manufacturers will supply you with a card like this. Mm -hmm. You know, I haven't seen too many cams yet that come, didn't come without it. Okay. okay. What we're going to do is we're going to put the cylinder head on and what I've done, and it, it's, it's for ease of operation and ease of turning the motor over, by hand is I've installed light springs and these springs you can go to the hardware store and buy a real lightweight spring assemble the, the valve into the head with the retainer in this case we're using using a ratio rocker which needs the use of the lash cap on the end of the valve these valves happen to be titanium and no matter what kind of rocker you use you will use a lash cap there but this will not apply as for just setting rocker on geometry but we're going to use a ratio rocker first, and you have to use a lash cap with a ratio rocker. And that lightweight spring just is something to hold the valve, the, the valve on the seat. Right. So it keep, it, it yeah. lets the cam, the, the, lets the valve train track the cam. That's all. It's right. very lightweight, very easy to turn over. We're only going to use two valves for ease of explanation and, and showing what we're going to do. Ultimately, you should go through and check each valve with your adjustable push rod until you're satisfied that that's the length push rod you want. Okay. We're going to put the head on it here. Just slide it down over the cylinders. And in, in, in the case of not having, not knowing whether we're going to have to notch pistons or anything like that, you can do this without the pistons in the engine. They're, they're totally non-related to what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. We're know. dealing with cam now. We're dealing with the cam and push rod length and rocker arm geometry. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it's probably the one thing that's overlooked the most in the assembly of a, of a high performance engine. Okay. If everything bolts together and the valves adjust, a lot of times people are satisfied with that. But you can gain or lose uh, maximum valve lift that's designed into the cam if the geometry is not correct. So we're going to show you how to do it, okay? This, like I said, we're going to use a ratio rocker first. This rocker arm multiplies the lift of the cam one and a half times, okay? Whenever the cam lifts the lifter, in this case it's going to lift at uh, 416 thousandths, it's going to multiply the lift at the valve by one and a half times. It's going to end up with 630 thousandths approximately at the valve. Now the ratio in this rocker arm is 1.5. Okay, So we're going to multiply whatever the cam does by 1.5 and it's going to make the valve do that. Okay, we're going to stick the rocker arm on it now. These particular rocker arms are Gene Berg. They're uh, in my opinion about the best you can get for the money and the ease of installation, you buy them and bolt them on and they won't give you too much trouble. And strength-wise. They're strength, they're, strong. they're bulletproof. You, know, you, you shouldn't have any trouble with them. They don't take any shim under the rocker arm on the stand, the, the boss, the stud here. They bolt right on in the stock location. No shim at all. Other rocker arms, if you use a Sig Urson rocker or uh, an Autocraft rocker arm, Autocraft claims you don't need a shim under it. I've seen sometimes you do. Uh, a Sig Urson rocker, you're going to need a shim for sure. We'll go into what a Sig Urson needs a little bit later. Okay, we're going to slide the rocker arms on. First, let me back up a minute here. 
This is an adjustable push rod. Easy to make. You can make one out of a, a lot of different things. You can use a, a, a long bolt ground down all thread rod. It's ground down on the end with a, a, an adjustment in the middle somehow. What I've done here is this is a 3 8 push rod on the top and a 5 16 in the bottom and I've threaded the inside of the 3 8 to a 8 millimeter uh, 125 I think and cut threads on the OD of this one the same they screw together with a jam nut you can make a number of different ends for this and you'll have yourself a set of adjustable push rods that are, are very handy to have if you're going to do this more than once I'm going to check the intake first we'll crank the motor around make sure that the lobe is down like so slide the rocker arm shaft on Find a hole here a little bit. Okay. Now, for all practical purposes, we're going to check everything at a lash that the engine's going to maintain when it's hot. In this particular case, this thing's going to run with about 15 thousandths valve lash when it's hot. So I'm going to take a 15 thousandths feeler gauge. I'm going to stick it in here. I'm going to adjust the valve to 15 thousandths, okay? You have to be careful because with the light spring, you can overcome it and actually take away some of your lash. Run down the jam nut a little bit just so it doesn't get loose or change on you. Okay, now, let's talk about geometry and what geometry is. In this particular case, what we're going to try to accomplish is a relationship between the stem of the valve, the center line, the pivot point of the rocker arm, and the push rod. Okay? Now, we don't want to push this valve from one direction the whole time. We want to start pushing it from the bottom side, work to the center, and get to the top. And at the center, you want that to be at half lift. And in this particular case, let's round it off, let's say the valve is going to open 600 thousandths. At 300 thousandths, you're going to want your geometry to be that that's the point you're going to check it. That's the only time you're going to know if it's right or not. And in the case of a high lift rocker arm, this adjusting screw and the push rod are going to want to be in line with each other, straight through, just as if they, they were one solid piece going through, parallel to each other. If when it, it's at total lift, the push rod's like this, it comes back, at half lift, it's straight, and when the valve is closed, it's going to be, you know, in that position. All right? If it's not what I just showed you, it's not correct. Well, go okay. at half lift. At half lift. You want You want these things to be straight, straight with each other. Okay? Straight through. Now, the Jeanberg rocker arm is probably the easiest rocker arm to obtain correct geometry with because he's taken the time to design the rocker arm correctly for the Volkswagen head. Okay, I'll go into the uh, Sig Urson rockers and what you have to do to try to correct what hasn't been designed into it. It's easy to do and we'll cover it. Okay, now what we're going to do is we're going to put a dial indicator on the valve. Come down. And we're going to want to measure how much lift we've got. Okay, according to the to the cam card here. This is fairly straight also. Yeah. According to the cam card, this thing should have 635 thousandths approximately, saying that the ratio in the rocker arm is correct and the lift in the cam is correct as per the card. Okay. 
we're going to rotate this around. We're going to start rotating it. And we're going to watch for that indicator to move. And the valve will start to open. Okay, there it goes. There's 100, 200, 300, 400, 5, 600, and 32 thousandths. And we're within a couple thousandths of what we want. It's satisfactory. Okay, now we're going to check geometry. We've noticed that as it goes through this sweeping curve here, that it's, it's worked properly. Now the valve is closing. We're going to go back and close it all the way to zero. Taking with these light springs, sometimes you got to make sure that the, the retainer gets seated properly. Okay, we're going to start over again. But we saw that it had 630 thousandths lift. So we're going to take half of that. It's going to be 315 thousandths. We're going to crank the engine around. Turn your, your crank or your pulley here until a valve starts to open again. Then we're going to go to 100, 200, 300, and 15. And we're going to check what we showed you before right here. The straight line, just as if you were to intercept the line through the push rod, right through the adjusting screw. As Bill holds up this pointer here, you can see that we're straight with each other. That's what, that's what correct geometry is. If when you get to 315 thousandths and that thing is pointed this way or that way, it's not right. Okay. Now we're going to show you what you have to do to correct it. And we're going to just crank the motor through here. And there we go. Okay. In the case of the Gene Bird rocker, you're not going to have the problem because the relationship between the rocker arm and the boss on the head are correct. And if the valves are installed in the head in the correct height, there won't be a problem. Okay. In the case of, a, of an Urson rocker, and the use of a lash cap, it may require putting a shim between the head and the rocker arm. Okay, I've got some shims over here, I think. Yeah, here we go. And you can buy these in a little kit form from just about any VW performance shop, or you can send us and we'll send them to you. They're a little shim, and they go between the boss and the rocker. Here, Bill will hold up another head. They go right on here like this, between this boss and the rock arm shaft. And what that does is it moves the shaft up into a range that it can sweep the foot of the valve with this shoe right here and correctly obtain the, you know, the, the correct geometry. And every time you move this around, you have to change your push rod length. And that's why we've got an adjustable push rod here. When you finally obtain correct geometry, lock down your push rod, go on and check all the other valves. And if, if everything's consistent in your engine, the assembled height of the stem of the valve, the uh, cylinder head surface from one to the other, then your push rod length should be the same all the way through. When you've you know, obtained a a good push rod length, lock your push rod down. You can buy a blank push rod like this. One of the ends isn't in it. See, it's got one end in it here and none in it there. You can take the push rod you've got here, use it as a guide, shorten this push rod accordingly, drive the end in it, and you've got yourself a push rod that's ready to go. In the case of this engine here, it's going to have dual springs on it. I recommend using a 3-8 chromoly push rod. It's a large diameter, very strong push rod, and it'll, it'll withstand a tremendous amount of abuse in, in the form of a racing engine. Or even in the case of any dual spring, I recommend that push rod. Okay, uh, let's pull this off and we'll show what, what happens with a, a stock rocker arm in the case of 
Now the lift on this rock arm is, uh, what was it again? Well, the lift on the cam and the lift of the, of the valve is 630 thousandths at the valve. Yeah. The, this, the, bird, this, the bird rocker. This rocker arm, <clears throat> bird makes two different types. Mm -hmm. He has a 1.45 one, a 1 and a 1.53. And a stock rocker arm, a 1600 stock rocker arm is? 1.1 1, 1. 1. 1. to 1. Yeah. Mm -hmm. a, a stock cam has 300 thousandths lift. Multiplied through the 1.1 1. 1 is 330 thousandths. Mm -hmm. So the cam is pushing the push rod up 300 thousandths, multiplies it through the rocker arm and open the valve 330 thousandths. It's, it's just simple mathematics, you know, and it, a lot of times, the cam has to be designed to use the ratio rockers, though. You just can't put ratio rockers on any cam. You can't go down and buy a, a cam that was designed to use a stock rocker arm mm -hmm. and put ratio rockers on it, other than a stock cam. A stock mm -hmm. cam will maintain itself with a ratio rocker, but that's the only one. Anything else, you get way too much lift, and the duration is real short, and you end up with... Uh, not a real smooth running engine. And sometimes you, they, there's not enough allowance in the stem, uh, the uh, guide bosses and spring clearance, coil bind, things like that have to be checked. How, how do I find out if, if the particular cam that... It'll be marked. When you buy the cam, you know, ask the cam grinder when you buy it or the, the people you buy it from, they should be able to tell you, you know. But nine times out of 10, like, uh, in this case, this is an angle cam, and it tells you that this is to be used with a ratio rocker. It won't say it on the card, but it'll say it when you buy the cam. I see. You know, I see. It says to be used with a one point. Everything they figured on that cam card is figured for a 1.5 ratio rocker. rocker arm. Okay, now what we're going to do here is we're going to take this stock rocker arm shaft and put it on this same head and show what we're going to have to do to achieve correct geometry on it. We've put the stock rock arm on this to show you the difference and what to look for when, if you're not using a cam that's going to have a ratio rocker on it, how to look for getting correct geometry with the adjusting screw on this end. Okay, it's, it's actually simpler this way than it is the other way because the adjusting screw is easier to judge its angle to the valve then sometimes the adjusting screw on this end with the push rod okay now what we're going to do is we're going to crank it through we've got the dial indicator set up like we did before we're going to turn it through this is going to have 460 thousandths lift at the valve through this 1.1 ratio rocker okay so we'll crank it around and there's one two, three, four, about 465, okay? And we're gonna come back, let it come back to zero. Then we're gonna start over again, let it come back. We're gonna go at three, about 333 thousandths, 330. There's one, two, three, 30. Okay, Bill's going to hold up <coughs> the pointer there, and you can see that the adjusting screw is pretty straight on with the valve. In this particular case, we could actually raise up the rocker arm shaft with a shim right there and shorten the push rod just a little bit. I think we'd get even better geometry, okay? Now, I'm not gonna go through and do it, because I wanna show, I wanna go into the Urson rocker and show what happens there. But to get correct geometry, and a change has to be made, don't make big drastic changes, okay? Sit and analyze the problem if, if it's not right. You know, there, there is a solution to it. You know, if, if you can't see the solution, Call somebody, you know. Call us, drop me a line, and we'll try to answer it for you. There, I'm sure somebody out there can answer it for you. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it is obtainable. And it's simple to do. And the, the, the smaller the cam, 
the less critical it can be. Okay, if you've got a cam that's got 380 thousandths lift, the rocker arm geometry isn't nearly as critical as a cam that has 600 thousandths or 500 thousandths. So there's a, kind of a, a breaking point as to it's critical. Okay, now we're going to take this off. I'm going to crank this back up here. Put the the Urson rocker on. This is a partially assembled Urson rocker arm. Here, we sh we put the Urson rocker arm on now, and we set the adjusting screw. And about the middle of its travel, there's an oil slot in this adjusting screw, and you don't want to run it too far out one way or too far back the other way. You want to be able to have some adjustment, keep that adjusting screw close to the middle where it's supposed to be. Okay, show them where the, there's the, the oiling slot in the hole. Oil travels up the push rod, through the adjusting screw, out a hole in the rocker arm and oils the contact surface of the rocker arm on the shaft. Okay, now, we've got this bolted down. We're going to put the dial indicator back on it again. Things getting so used to being here, it's going to be part of the motor when we start it up. And you'll never know it. Okay, we're going to crank this around. And we go 100, 200, 300, 400, 500, 600, and 20. Okay, this Urson rocker arm, its ratio is a 1.47 ratio. It's not a true 1.5 ratio. So it's not going to lift that valve as far as the Gene Bird did, which actually, in, in actuality, on the cam ends up being about a 1-5, about a true 1-5 ratio. So it's going to lift the valve further through its ratio than the Urson is. The Urson is a good rocker arm. We use them on our, in fact, our race engine has Urson rocker arms on it right now. And I have very few problems with them to speak of. We're done here. We've, we've come up. We've got 620 thousandths lift. We're going to turn right around and come back to zero. And just like we did before, bring it around at 310 thousandths. We're going to try to have correct correct geometry. Mm -hmm. Here's 100, 200, 300, and. 310. Okay, now we're right back over here to the adjusting screw on this end and the geometry of it, the, the straight line we're going to intersect through the adjusting screw right through the push rod and there it is. It came out correct again. If it didn't come out correct, if at this point the rock arm adjusting screw were leaning one way or the other, you would accommodate it with Sometimes the length of the push rod and shims under the rocker arms. Okay, the first thing you want to do is put a, the, the smallest shim under the rocker arm, put it back together, compensate in the length of the push rod, and check it again. If it gets worse, then you know you went too far. You know, if it, if it got better, you obviously made the right choice. There's no real rules in a Volkswagen that's had modifications to the cylinder head because you've changed all the relative checking points. The, the valve stem height in the head, in, the, in a head that's had big valves installed in it, is not going to be what it used to be or what the factory set it up to be. You know, if the heads have been ported, competition valve jobs, things like this change the assembled height of the valve. So these things are going to change everything we do in the setup. That's why we're showing you the different places to check for correct geometry. Okay? We're going to bring it back around, let it go to full lift again. We're back up to 620. Come on back down here. And that's about the extent of rocker arm geometry. 
as we go through, we might find a few things that we, we might have even left out of here, and I'll try to bring them up so that, you know, we don't leave you sitting in the dark. You know, we'll talk about a few other things as, as we go through and a little bit that might help enlighten you in your rock arm geometry, too. Fascinating. Just fascinating. Yeah, it's amazing these things will run at the RPM, you know. As long as we remember, we remember the uh, the uh, the fact of the uh, uh, when, when it's at uh, half lift mm -hmm. that uh, it should be half lift is the key. Straight up in the half That's lift the is key. the key. Yeah. You know, at half lift, either your adjusting screw on a high lift mm -hmm. will be in a straight line with the push rod. Mm -hmm. uh, on a stock rocker arm, your adjusting screw will be in a straight line with the valve. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Someone was doing this at home. Would they? They'd almost have to have a dial indicator, wouldn't they? Not necessarily. Okay. You could. You could get away with it. You could take a, a you veneer use a caliper. Pair of veneers and it's run a little, a little more crude. Run them down the side. You know, you can measure the okay. the, the distance the valve okay. travels okay. that way. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. that's the main reason. The dial indicator is nice to have. You know, mm -hmm. if you're going to do a lot of this, you can buy one of these at Sears for a reasonable amount of money, and it's something you can have and use. Definitely get at least a uh, oh one inch travel on a dial indicator. Well, you can use a dial indicator all over the yeah. engine too. Uh, uh, you can use it for in play. You can use it for deck height. You can use it for uh, cam latch, cam latch yeah. or cam lift. A, a, a number of different things. The you know? green, the cam. You yeah, you, it. you'll well, use it. Well, you know, you'll see. You know, we use it for degreeing the cam, and then. Uh, well, I think we're going to go into uh, notching the piston. You can't determine how much notch you're going to need in the piston until you know the valve is going to open this far. Okay, okay. now we're going to go to uh, go, go to the mill. Yeah. And we're going to be notching a piston. All right. Well, first oh, we're going to show how to mark the piston for a notch. Okay. How to locate the notch. That's right. probably the most important thing when you're going to notch a piston. Mm -hmm. And. The, the, the guy at home isn't going to be able to notch his own piston. I can guarantee it. Okay? But he's going to have to mark them. And he's going to have to determine whether they're notched right when he gets them back. And this is what we're going to show. Okay? We're going to show how to mark it correctly so that when you do take it to a machine shop, they will be able to put the notch where you want it for your motor. A lot of places will take and just say, send me your pistons, and they'll haphazardly notch them kind of by as a on, a, on a basic place on the piston, and that's an incorrect on a Volkswagen. You take a set of cylinder heads like this with the welding that gets done to them, and the modifications and the guide location, everything changes enough, there's not four notches going to be exactly in the same place. Anybody that tells me they can notch a piston, four of them in the machine, and give them back to the person without having them scribed or marked, I can't see how they do it. Well, especially on a motor like this, we don't want the notch to be bigger or in the wrong location because if it's in the wrong location, it's going to end up being bigger or the valve's going to hit the piston, which is going to cut down, it's going to make the notch bigger and it's going to cut down the compression ratio because you're going to have a very big notch. The compression ratio on a motor like this is very important that you have what you want. And to achieve that, you want a uniform notch you know, you have to know the volume of each notch. These have to be measured in, in cubic centimeters. And when we get done, we want to try to have as close to the same displacement in each notch as possible so that we have the same compression ratio in each cylinder. You know, that's why we're going to be very exact as to how we mark them, how we notch them. We will, we will CC them and measure it. And uh, check them after we've notched them. And we'll check them. We'll show you. will use the dial indicator to check the, the depth of the notch. We'll show how it's done. We'll actually, the engine will be set up just like this. We'll go through, and at a certain point on the degree wheel is where the valve's going to be closer to the piston. And we'll check it. We'll show that. We're going to take the cylinder head. We've glued the top of the piston, put it at top dead center, and we're going to slide the cylinder head on here. And bring it down like that. We'll drop a couple of washers on it. And the 
gonna snug it up a little bit. Now, when you do this, you can do it at top dead center and get away with it. But by all rights, it should be done on the intake valve at between five and 10 degrees after top dead center. And the exhaust valve should be between five and 10 degrees before top dead center. Okay, so we're gonna bring it around so that it's about seven degrees after top dead center. Bill's gonna hook the pointer up here so we can see a little closer. Okay, there we come to seven degrees after top dead center. And go over there, Bill, is my punch on the blue shelf there. It looks like that's what I need. This fits down the valve guide. You don't have the head assembly when this is done. You've got it exposed. There's no valves or springs or anything on it. The piston in that position on the intake we drop this down the valve guide. You know what this, this tool is here. Every Ford garage has one. We put a mark. Okay, this has got a point on it. Anything with a point that fits down the valve guide. Okay. Next, we're gonna take it and rotate it over here to seven and a half or so degrees before top dead center, we're going to go down the exhaust guide, another one of these, and hit it. Okay, that's the center of our valve and location on the piston. We'll take a scribe a little later and we'll scribe a mark on there just with a, with a compass. The diameter, we want to cut a notch in there to clear the pistons. Okay, we're only going to do this one piston and then we're going to check it. We're going to put light springs on the valves, like we did when we did rock arm geometry. We're going to bring it around to this position with a dial indicator on it, and that's going to check the clearance between the valve and the piston at this particular location. Okay? So now, when you're building the engine, would you do one at a time like that? Is that no. what you're saying? You'd assemble the whole thing to mark it. But right now, I'm only going to do one. I don't want to cut four pistons okay. wrong. I want to cut one, check it. If it needs more or needs better location, then we'll, we'll get that piston right, and we're satisfied. Then we'll duplicate. We'll go back and we'll mark the other three pistons. Other three. And cut them the same distance. Cut them the same distance I did this one that was successful. And then when you're done, you go back through and you check, check them, them all. Check them all. You check them for clearance, and you check them for location. Okay. We'll take the head off here. Now that we've made our punch marks, they just call me Butterfingers to not leave it. And I'll emphasize that when we've made the mark with the punch, if you're going to send me the pistons or wherever you're going to send the pistons to have them scribed, just, just leave the punch mark and tell me what size valve you've got or tell whoever's going to do this what size valve you're going to use. They'll do the rest. In this particular instance, we're going to have a 42 millimeter intake valve and what we want to do, split the difference, that's 21 millimeters and add a millimeter for, uh, works better if I use these things in millimeters. We've got 21, we're gonna add a millimeter for clearance, the radial clearance of the valve when it goes into the piston. On this particular engine, that valve is actually gonna go down into that pocket. There's gonna be that much lift at the valve. I'm gonna set up this caliper here at 22 millimeters, which is gonna give me a millimeter of, of clearance additionally. Put it in the mark we made and just right around. 
I do this like this, it'll work a little better. We just come right around, make a scribe mark, okay? We're going to turn right around. The 38 millimeter valve, that's 19 millimeters, we'll give it another millimeter radial clearance. We'll set this thing at 20 millimeters. We'll come right in here like this and we'll scribe it. Now, like I said before, you don't have to do this unless you're going to notch your own pistons or have that facility. Also, one thing that should be brought up now, when you're putting the pistons on the motor, now is the time to mark them as to their location. Their location. Number one, number two, number three, and number four. Because once they get notched, right and left, it does make a difference. You, can, you can't mix them up. The intake notch is different than the exhaust. You don't want to end up having one in the wrong hole. And you don't want a number three piston on a number two side, because it will make a difference. Yeah. That's why we're going to this. Any, anybody that can notch a piston and give it to you right without doing this is a heck of a lot better than we are. I've never, I've never seen it done yet you know where they're absolutely correct this will be absolute and we can run a lot closer tolerances in the engine and keep a better uh, uh, a closer watch on even compression ratio well, throughout this engine like you said anybody can notch a piston the notches will be real deep in comparison to what they need to be which you lose cc's in the motor and you won't be able to get the compression ratio you want this motor is going to be very critical because of the size you're going to need the smallest notch possible, but yet it has to have the clearance. That's about that. Next, next we'll go into showing you how that piston's notched and how to check it. We'll light spring it like we did with the geometry. Mm -hmm. So we're going to go over to the uh, go over to the uh, piston notch. Yeah. yeah, we'll go over to the milling machine. machine. Where we've yeah. got an apparatus that goes in there, holds the piston, and we'll okay. cut the notches and come back and. And we'll be able to see that. Okay. We'll try to keep our fingers out of the whole mess too. And from here we'll we'll go to the valve notcher and we'll cut our our notches. An engine like this, this engine is going to have about 14 and a half to one compression. We're probably going to have to cut about 185 thousandths deep notch in that piston. And uh, it seems like a lot, but it's better to have the clearance. You want to usually run between 60 to 80 thousandths piston to valve clearance. That is, when, the, when that valve is in its closest relationship to the piston, you want to have that much clearance. Okay? Might not hit but you want to have that in case the valve's going to valve float. Why don't you explain a little bit about the procedure when you take, take it over to the milling machine. That's a beautiful new fixture you've made over there, too, by the way. I have to congratulate you on that. Oh, well, you know how it is. Explain uh, what that is on the, uh, with the fixture you have there. The fixture just holds the piston at 9.5 degrees, the same angle the valves are at in relationship to the head, mm -hmm holds the piston at that number of degrees on the center line of the pin. And those marks that we scribed, scribed earlier, uh -huh. that right here, it does, the cutter just goes right The cutters are scribe. designed, I, I had those cutters, I had my dad make those cutters for me, and they cut that notch right to a 42 millimeter notch and a 38 millimeter notch just as we scribed it. Did a gorgeous job. 42. And, uh, well the notch clears the valve. The, the notch is actually a little bigger than that, but it's fine. Anyway, we're going to set this back on. Now the piston's back in, the cylinder's on. We've put our light springs. We can see the valves open up there. The light springs are on the head so we can go through and check that piston to valve clearance now. We're going to run this down. We're going to mount our dial indicator back on it again. We already know our pulley's right. We've been through all that. Right in here, we're going to put the push rod in. Set the rocker arms on. Because we haven't made up our whole set of push rods, we can still use our adjustable push rod. 
and do all our checking with that. We'll run it down. Get a little bit ahead of me there, but I'll I'll pull it off like this. Okay. We've got the right amount of lash we're supposed to have. Now what we're going to do is we're going to rotate the engine around first of all just to make sure that we do have clearance. I'm going to hang on this rod. Nothing's hit anything yet. Okay, there we got 630 thousandths lift. We're coming back up. And there we are back to zero again. Okay, now what we're going to do, the intake valve's closest position to the piston is going to be after top dead center. So we're going to come around here. The valve starts to open. Our timing mark here comes up. We're going to start at about five degrees after top dead center. I'm going to bring it around here. There's top dead center. There's five degrees after top dead center. Bill's going to zero the gauge, and this is going to tell us now, with the light spring, I can lift the valve off the lifter. You'll see how much clearance there actually is now between the piston and the valve. Right now, we've got 30 thousandths clearance between the piston and the valve the way it's set up. Now we don't, we don't know yet, we may have a place that's closer than that. So I'm going to move it two and a half degrees further after top dead center, re-zero the gauge, and check it again. Okay, now we're down to 28,000, so we're getting closer, we're not getting further away. I'm going to move it another two and a half degrees. We're up to 10 degrees now. Okay, now we're back to 30. So we know that at seven and a half degrees was our closest point between that piston and valve. We've got 28 thousandths, that's not enough. We're gonna take this piston now, we're gonna cut an additional uh, 35 to 40 thousandths in it. We're gonna take the rest of them and cut them. Exactly the same. I'm gonna take and go over here and we're gonna check the exhaust valve. We're gonna check it the same way except for we check it before top dead center, not after top dead center. We'll check it. Because this was consistent at seven and a half, I'll check that one at seven and a half because of the way the cam is designed. Okay, now we'll just come back up here and take the, take the yeah. We'll pull this off of here. We'll just switch our push rod over to the... Now you're going to do the exhaust. We're going to do the exhaust. The exhaust is actually sometimes more critical. It sometimes takes more clearance or a deeper notch in the piston than the intake. It's also more critical because the piston encounters that valve in a different direction. <coughs> and can do actually more damage. And engines that we've seen in the past that have insufficient clearance and a valve's gonna hit it, nine times out of 10 it's the exhaust valve that hits because of the momentum of the system. Okay, right now we're just gonna crank it through and make sure that it doesn't come up and hit anything. Okay. The exhaust valve is going to encounter on the upward stroke of the piston. Okay. So I'm going to set this at seven and a half because it was so consistent before on the intake. And we'll use that as our starting point. And we'll check it. Okay, and we did a good job on the exhaust. We've got 65 thousandths clearance. 
<clears throat> we're going to go and move it back to 5 degrees and see if it gets any closer. Nobody's perfect. The cam grinder might be a little bit off. Okay, now, now we're up to 75, so that's even better. Well, you want to be careful not to have too much. Uh, you right, don't you don't want to give up anything. Yeah. But 75,000 is ideal piston to valve clearance. Okay. For the exhaust valve. For the exhaust, for the exhaust valve. valve. What, okay. What's their ideal for the intake? The intake, I like to have about 60. Okay. You know, it, it varies depending the kind of spring you're going to run, the kind of valve you're going to use. A titanium valve, you can run less clearance. The valve is lighter, has less rebound on the spring, and they won't go into float quite as fast as a steel valve will. Okay, now I'm going to go up here to 10 degrees and have Bill zero that and we'll check it. Okay, we're back to 65 again. So we know we're, we're home safe mm -hmm. right there. When I re-notch the intake here, I'll probably hit that exhaust about another 10 thousandths mm -hmm. and we'll be fine. And if they have their pistons notched, must they must do this. They procedure. must check it. They must check it. They must procedure. check it. Yeah. It can it can ruin a uh, hundred dollars worth of stainless steel valves and four hundred dollars worth of titanium valves if it's not right. And waste a heck of a lot of time. And a lot of time, you know. Yeah. Miss the race. Right. Yeah. Well, not only miss the race, you can. <laughs> I'd I'd miss the race for four hundred bucks. <laughs> and uh, we'll take this off of here now. And we'll go back and we'll notch all the valves, assemble the motor up, complete. We've got our, our cam is dialed in, our deck is set, our case is clearanced. We've basically got a pump here that's ready to start making horsepower after it's assembled properly. We'll go through some of the basic things to watch out for on the assembly of an engine like this against a uh, uh, engine you drive back and forth to work. Mm -hmm. There's a few little things that would be different. Mm -hmm. I think uh, the biggest thing to watch for is in assembly is that cleanliness. You know, we started out talking about clean. Yeah. You you can't you can't have it too clean. This is the clean room. You don't do any grinding in this room. No. Uh, this you don't have any shavings on the floor in here. Now, if there's it, anything though? you missed in, in anything we've done so far, if there's any, any particular thing, you just roll the tape back and go over it again until you get it absolutely clear in your mind and, and you're sure of, of, of the steps we've gone through. Some of the machining you've seen, of course, you're yeah, not going to be able to do. So you're going to have to get uh, Dick and Bill to do them. Or you're going to have to find someone in the area that knows what they're doing, understands all these processes, and they're going to have to do it for you. We're going to, we're going to try to let the guy understand what he's going to build, why he's going to build it, and not just be a, a, a bolt a carburetor on it and think he's got a hot rod Volkswagen. You know, what we, what we want to say is the caliber of this engine is far beyond that of a a, a progressive holly and a, a angle 110. It's those those are good things. They do add performance, but they're not what you call a race worthy Volkswagen engine. And it's also, if if I if I might interject and I see if you agree, it's also far beyond a case that's bored out, 92 slipped on it, and a cam mm -hmm. put in it, and a zenith slapped on it. Right. It's far beyond that. Right. Yeah. Well, what we're trying to point out here. And everything we do is a, a procedure that's going to gain the most out of everything you've done to it, starting from the choice of parts. You know, I think that if you're going to build an engine, sit down and decide what you want. You know, you're going to want a you're going to want a 69 stroke by 88 millimeter bore. You know, and will that serve your purpose? You know, that's the most economical way to build an engine. You can get away with a less expensive connecting rod, a, a less expensive crankshaft, no extensive case clearancing, things like this. Yeah, and uh, we dynoed 
your particular race engine the other day. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that for a little bit, and we'll show everybody when we're dynoing it. Uh, go ahead and tell us about that right now. Remember when we well, that that particular engine is uh, it's it's out of our race car, mm -hmm. and it's a seventeen hundred cc engine, or actually it's sixteen hundred and seventy nine cc's. It's a stock stroke. It's a stock stroke engine. It's got a 69 stroke crank in it, and it's got 88 millimeter pistons and cylinders on it. And look at the RPM we're getting out of this. <clears throat> look at the horsepower we're producing. It produced uh, just a little over 200 horsepower, 204 to be exact, at 8,500 RPM. Can you believe that? 200, 200, and a little over 200 uh, horsepower on a stock stroke Volkswagen motor. That's what we just saw and maybe we'll see just a little bit more of it right now mm -hmm. and uh, see the RPM that we can get out of this thing. Yeah. Look at that. Look at that RPM. It uh, kind of amazes you when you stop and think of how fast it's going around. Yeah. You know, just picture what revolutions per minute means. You know, and it's so loud out there that we yeah. even had to put earmuffs on the dog, didn't yeah. we? Yeah, he doesn't like the noise. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> well, that also the, the 8500 is just what we can run it on our dyno. Mm -hmm. It does produce horsepower farther than that. It does. But our yeah. dyno doesn't have enough water pressure to hold it, the RPM. It'll make horsepower to around 9,700 RPM. I mean, it won't withstand it. You know, the, 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 water that, the water pressure that our property has here isn't mm -hmm. sufficient mm -hmm. enough to, to maintain it. Well, I didn't mean to uh, uh, interrupt what you were saying. Oh, no I just problem. wanted to show, us, uh, show everyone about that, uh, that, that, that exciting dyno we did the other day. Uh, please continue. You were talking. Well, we were talking about what a basic hot rod Volkswagen motor would be, and in my opinion, it would be, for economic reasons, a 69 stroke with an 88 millimeter bore or 90.5 or a, a 90 millimeter NPR pistons and cylinders. These are efficient piston and cylinder combinations. You know, they're. There are other bigger pistons and cylinders. Well, you better clarify yourself then when you when you say 88 millimeters, okay, it's not 88, the slip-in 88. No, not a slip-in 88. An 88 millimeter piston and cylinder that you have to bore the case and the cylinder head for. The only slip-in piston and cylinder that belongs in a Volkswagen is 85 and a half. Anything other than that yes. belongs on the shelf the somewhere else. The cylinder walls are getting too thin. Mm -hmm. But that particular combination a 69 by 88 with the right cam and the right cylinder heads is capable of making the average street car of around 1,600 pounds run in the neighborhood of uh, 13 and a half seconds at, a, at around 100 miles an hour. And this is very respectable. Mm -hmm. You know, it would scare the death out of you on the street. <laughs> you know, there, there's, right. there's no reason to think that you have to have an 82 stroke or a 78 stroke to go that fast. Now that the, the longer the stroke gets in the motor, the, the, the more torque it can produce at a lower RPM and you can make the car go faster with no doubt about it. That same car with an 82 by 88 motor which would be 2000 cc's with the same cam and same heads would probably run 1250s mm -hmm. you know with the right gearing and in the same weight car. So they're, they're, I'm not putting down long stroke. I'm just saying economically wise, this is this is the uh, almost a better way to go, you know. Twenty one eighty, twenty one eighty. That's all I hear everywhere I turn. Twenty one eighty. That's the magic number, I think. Yeah. You yeah. know, it was for a long time. Mm -hmm. You know, well, it was certainly a very inexpensive. Yeah, you know, yeah. you can. The only thing is, is to buy a good eighty two stroke crank. You're going to spend a lot of money mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. You know, roller cranks are. Uh, a thing of the past, yeah. in my opinion, you know. They they're get, very expensive and they don't last. They won't last in a drag race car. Yeah. They won't last you in know. a street car either. But the, the, the cylinder heads, the piston and cylinder choice are two of the most important, along with the cam, choices that you can make in the, the idea behind hot rodding your Volkswagen. Those will give you the most performance gains for the, the least amount of money. You know, you'll spend a lot of money on your cylinder heads that have them done right, but you will definitely appreciate what you spent. 
Yeah. You know. Do we want to talk about cylinder heads a little bit? Yeah, we because, can uh, uh, we, we point took, out a few things here. Well, um, we took the camera down and uh, we watched you uh, mark the, uh, the, the lay out the combustion lay, lay chamber. Out the combustion chamber and the intake uh, ports. And uh, we also watched you uh, uh, flow the head down there. Yeah, we, we flowed a couple different cylinder heads. Yeah, uh, we can talk about that too uh, a little bit later. But we, uh, we showed how we laid out the chamber. Yeah. Now this particular cylinder head that's going on this engine is, uh, it's worthy of putting on the street. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's just that the compression ratio would be too high. But when, when you... Can uh, you see this in here? Can the camera come in and take a take a look at this right here? Do you think you can do that just a second? Yeah. Okay. Okay. And, uh, this particular cylinder head, you don't really need this big a head on the street. It's not necessary. I think that you can get by with a smaller port and have something that is a little more drivable on the street. You might also at this point, they're probably wondering why the valve seats look gold. Okay, these, this is aluminum silicon bronze valve seats. We use these in a drag race engine primarily because they'll last a little longer. That's okay, now that's, that's aluminum silicon bronze. Seats. It's the same Very material important. that valve guides are made out of. Yes. And not, not just uh, go some and just say put some bronze seats in there. Uh, because they're, uh, Toyotas use a different kind of bronze. And, yeah. And uh, it's very important that uh, if you have someone slip in bronze seats that... Uh, I don't recommend bronze seats for the street yeah. at all. Uh, the expense would be the, the number one reason. Uh, a cylinder head for the street, cost-wise, anywhere from five hundred to nine hundred dollars is the price range you can look for mm -hmm. and not always is the most expensive going to get you the best cylinder head yeah you know if you're looking for cylinder heads and th there's a lot of places that make them you know that, that, that will sell you a cylinder head i think that when you're that to that point you're willing to spend that kind of money talk to somebody that's that does it and is successful at it, not just pulls one off the shelf and hands you a ported cylinder head. This is a waste of time. Well, to, uh, a cylinder head that's going to work on your motor is a custom-made cylinder head, made for your combination. Mm -hmm. The cam you have, the displacement, mm -hmm. and the carburation you're going to run, the weight of the car, that all makes a difference on getting the right cylinder head to get the most performance out of your car. Because a cylinder head is the one thing that's going to give you the most benefit out of a Volkswagen model. That and the cam choice. Something else you might think about is when you're just, if you're going to buy a cylinder head, let's say, and you walk in and you, some guy says, I've got a cylinder head here I want to sell you. Find out what the compression ratio is in that head. You know, if you can't, if he can't tell you, have him find out, take it somewhere where they can measure the volume in here and they can tell you what the compression ratio is. If you've got a uh, 82 by 88 engine and you put a head on there that was designed to have ten and a half to one compression on a 1700 and you're going to put it on this 2000 cc motor all of a sudden you're going to have over 11 and a half or 12 to one compression which is something you can't live with on the street today nine and a half on a dual carbureted motor is about the end of the line for a car on pump gas at 92 octane we dyne, uh not dynoed we <laughs> flow test we oh. flow we flowed this particular head mm -hmm. explain uh Explain, we're going to look, see a little bit of that flow that we did right now. Mm -hmm. um, explain what, uh, what this 12 uh, inches of mercury is all about. First. Okay, that 12 inches is your, your basis. Okay, your that's, your, that's your specific gravity for the, the, the test. All right, you could pick any number on this, on this uh, uh, incline. Uh, this isn't the incline, this is the, the vertical manometer. Mm -hmm. Okay, but 12 is a good number to use. Well, it's a lot of people use it. Well, it's a basis that we know. We, we flow, we all, flow our all our heads at 12. At 12. So yeah. there's yeah. no yeah. rule. It's a reference point for you. Right. Reference That's all it is. Really. Your flow rate. And okay. It, and then the in, the uh, the incline, incline manometer. Mm -hmm. That's a comparison from an orifice behind the flow bench of the air going through it against the air going by the valve, and that's what gives us our reading on the manometer. And we open the valve a hundred thousand at a time. For the lift that we've determined, that we we're duplicate going to have. the lift that the cam is going to have. Uh -huh. You know, if mm -hmm. you if you if I do you a set of cylinder heads, and you tell me you're going to put a uh, 
uh, FK89, and it's going to have 630 thousandths total lift. I'm going to flow this head at 630 thousandths at increments of 100 thousandths. And sometimes, if I'm fine tuning this area in the seat when I'm working mm -hmm. the cylinder head, when I'm making it, yeah. I will flow it at 50 thousandths. Every 50 thousandths, I'll make a change because it, it's a little more critical. The, the head is very sensitive in these areas to making better flow. And that's what it takes to get a good cylinder head and one that just has a 45 degree cut on there and a valve thrown in it. It's not going to work the same. Now the reading that we got uh, with this particular head on the incline, our final reading to... Uh, it was 11.9. There it is, 11.9. Mm -hmm. This head flowed extremely well mm -hmm. for a... a a 42 millimeter valve. Mm -hmm. A little later on, we'll, we'll show a uh, one of the new super flow heads that Dean mm -hmm. Lowry makes. Mm -hmm. You want to show that now? You want yeah, to we can talk show about that. that? Yeah. Okay. And uh, uh, we'll we'll just uh, go out and get one of those yeah. heads now, and then we'll show what what happened when we flowed that head. Right. Okay. Jerry's going to go out and get the other head. While he's gone, I'm going to bring up a fact here. This particular cylinder head is one that I make. This head complete in an all-out race situation. In other words, it's got titanium valves, aluminum silicon bronze seats, extensive modifications to the head in, in the area. We Well, you'll see here, up close here, the differences in the head, but this head is about a $1,600 cylinder head, okay? The other head, the Superflow head that, that Bug Pack is, is really behind and pushing right now, is a good head as a bolt-on item. But to make that head work to the degree that this head does, you will invest almost almost as much or more into that Superflow head. It doesn't come with a titanium valve. It doesn't come with uh, any specific modifications to the point where it can flow like this head does right out of the box. Here he comes. Here's, right the, here's the Superflow head right here. I don't know. Can you come in and take a look at this? This is a, a cast head that, uh, that's been totally redesigned. Okay. There was quite an article in Doom Buggy that Hot VW is on now, the head. Now, who makes this head? Uh, Dean Lowry and Ken Lowry. They, they make the head. Dino Dinosaurs of years okay, ago. Okay. okay. They make the head. They cast it and do all the machine work on it. Bug Pack is real big right now in, in uh, uh, selling the head. You know, they've, they've really done a campaign on it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's a fine head. It's a good head. There's nothing. There's not a thing in the world wrong with the head. But the, now you've reworked this head. Yeah, this head has been extensively reworked in the combustion chambers. Can you see the, this? The port, the opening, the valve jobs. This head, to get to work as good as this head, which and when I got done, it actually okay. worked just a little bit better. And on the, on uh -huh. the second half of the flow, up through what we flowed them at the same number of lift, same inches of lift, this head flowed just a little bit better. Okay, now this head, like this, is not out of the box. No. This is not out of this the box. This is not an out of the box head, by mm -hmm. no means. Okay, let's look at it. Let, let's look at the flow bench now, and we're going to see this he particular head uh, bolted on. Yeah. And we're going to see our uh, we'll our see reference point of twelve again. And here's our incline. Yeah, and you'll you'll see it go up here, right about here. After three hundred thousandths, you'll start to see the head is starting to pick up a little bit of flow, not by leaps and bounds, but a, a little bit. An increase is better than a decrease, and. On the bottom, from 100 to 300 thousandths, it didn't flow quite as well as my head does. Okay, mm -hmm. but the the differences is not enough to to worry about. They're they're not not enough to give a reason to to or you know to buy it or not to buy the head. Mm -hmm. You know, my biggest concern is that what's going to work best on the engine. Mm -hmm. If when we get to the point these go on an engine and they actually work better. Mm -hmm. Then I'll even have more to say about them. But right now, we haven't seen them on an engine. I've seen them on a few engines at the track, and I haven't been that impressed, only because the cars they were on didn't go faster than they did with a conventional head. I see. But yeah, that time, time will tell. You know, the more we work with something, the more we can make it work better.
So it's neat that someone. Uh, has, I think it's great. That went out into the you trouble. You know, went to the trouble. Yeah. And I'll point out the the alloy and the design of this head is is in my opinion better than a stock oak head. Everything a yeah. stock head should have been, huh? Yeah, in a few places a little more than than it needs to be. The ports are in yeah. some cases a little bit too big, but for an all-out drag race situation, it's it's a, a good okay. head. It's got a big port in it, but for the street, I don't think it's the answer. Because for about the money you spend on that out of the box, I can make a street head capable of, of making any size engine work to its to the maximum mm -hmm. okay if it's a 1700 or it's a two liter 82 by 88 any engine in there a head can be designed to work on it for about the same money and with not making any compromises at all you know and I might might mention the fact that all these things we mentioned and when I've mentioned an ET an elapsed time of 13 and a half seconds or uh, 12 and a half seconds, all these things are figured on the fact that the guy driving the car knows what he's doing, has done it more than once, and uh, there's a little experience behind him. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not going to go out there, build a motor that's capable of going 13 seconds, and have never driven it down the track and make it go 13 seconds. You know, it's not going to happen. So, these are things to keep in mind, you know, when you're doing it. More to the race than the motor. Right. Right. Make sure the car is safe too. Don't, yeah. don't go out in a death trap and end up, you know, the other side of the guardrail. We've seen that happen too many times. We're going to, uh, in fact, I'll, I'll go through and show a, a whole thing here on how, we've already showed you how to figure your deck, mm -hmm. okay, or how to, how to come up with how much deck you have. There's a formula for converting that into cubic centimeters. Take along with the cubic centimeters that are in this volume of the chamber here and comparing it to the volume of the cylinder you can calculate your compression ratio there's a very simple formula for it uh, we'll go through and and show you how to do it you know we'll we'll show how this how this is measured if you don't have a barrette i don't recommend going out and buying one because you won't use it that much i'm sure there's places around that can do it you know, or you can send the heads and I can calculate it and correct it, change it if you want. You know, bring the compression ratio to whatever your heart desires. But like I said before, if you're going to drive it on the street, nine and a half to one for pump gas is about it. You know, you can buy better gas, but it can start getting awful expensive. This is a barrette. It's graduated in cubic centimeters and there's 50 cubic centimeters in it. Okay, we're going to fill this with a we fill it with solvent, you can fill it with water or alcohol, any, any liquid. And uh, you know, this will remind you of your chemistry days back in uh, junior high school. And we're going to fill it up to the top, and we're going to place the head under it with the valves. You can do this with the head apart even, just grease the valves and drop them in on their seat, put the spark plug in it. We have this a plastic lid that we grease the face of the chamber, we lay it in like so with the valves in. Let me drop the valve in there, Bill. Let me see this exactly. The valves will be in like so. The spark plug will be in it. This will be greased and dropped in there. We'll fill this volume up with the liquid in here in measures. Very simple. We'll take whatever we get for a reading there. Let's say we got 35 cc's and we have in the deck height of this motor at 50 thousandths, there's going to be uh, 45 thousandths deck, which in cubic centimeters is uh, 7.5 cubic centimeters in that much depth. On, on an 88 bore. On an 88 bore. Okay. The diameter of the bore will vary that dimension but for what I'm what I'm going to say is that we've got 35 cc's here we've got seven and a half cc's in the deck and on a uh, this particular motor there is 450 cc's in one cylinder that's the cylinder volume 
you'd add the total of those up, you'd well, come you up have, with a total. In this motor, you also have notches. You okay, have to take you don't confuse them. Well. Uh, you'll take the total of all three of those volumes, the volume of the chamber, the volume of the deck, the volume of the cylinder, add it up, then take the total of the chamber, the total of the deck, and divide it into the total that you got of all of them, and it'll give you your compression ratio. All right? Static compression ratio. Yeah, static ratio. compression ratio. Uh, once you've done that, if you go on to the next one and CC it, you know, we will, we or anybody that does this for you, if they do it right, will CC all your, all your chambers. The rest of the volumes are a known fact. You know, your deck height may vary one or two or three thousandths, but this isn't important. You know, it's, it's not going to change it that much. Yeah. So basically, uh, we just wanted to show just a few of these, just to explain what deck, what, uh, not deck, what uh, CCing head is all about, just so you understand that. A standard Volkswagen head, unfly cut, standard chamber, has approximately 50 cc's in it. So, by diminishing those cc's, you increase the, the static compression ratio of the engine. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by static compression ratio? Static compression ratio is that as the thing sits here dead on the bench. And it's different than running compression ratio. <clears throat> when this thing is running at an idle, it might only have uh, five or six to one, maybe less, compression ratio, depending on the cam. The cam is the heart of the engine. It decides when the valves close in relationship to the position of the piston in the cylinder. And if the piston's halfway up the cylinder before the valve's closed, it's only going to compress what's left in the cylinder at that point. But the higher the RPM gets, mm -hmm. this merry-go-round starts chasing, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden, that compression ratio starts coming up. The stock engine got 7.7 .7 to 1 compression, okay? This engine has got 14 to 1 compression, all right? Static compression ratio is the way it hangs here on the bench, you know, just, just what you see, all right? Running compression is different from that of static compression ratio. This thing at an idle only has probably four or five to one compression, mm -hmm. all right? As the RPM comes up, this thing starts chasing itself, all right? And it gets into an advanced state in order to keep everything happening in a, in a realm which it can live with, the compression ratio starts getting greater, all right? So at uh, five to 6,000 RPM, it starts reaching that, our, that compression ratio mm -hmm. that we design into it, mm -hmm. you know, statically, all right? Uh, a stock engine, though, on the other hand, turns right around and does just the opposite through its cam design that it, at lower RPM, at let's say uh, 1500 RPM, between 1500 and uh, 3500 RPM, there's a curve in there in which the compression ratio reaches its peak, mm. you see? And that's the difference between a, a stock engine and this engine here with a different cam. The cam is the heart it decides how much air and fuel can enter that cylinder. And the cam timing in relationship to the piston timing can increase or decrease the amount in a different RPM range. That's why you say at 6,000 RPM it produced X amount of horsepower and a stock engine at 4,000 produced X. Somewhere along the line those two engines are going to create the same horsepower but at a different RPM range. You know, one higher, one lower. And that's how we end up with it. I'm sure we've forgotten a million things. Here's one of your things you want to get and keep around. It's super weather strip adhesive. You can use that for sealing the base of the cylinders. Right around the base. Right, on, right around here. 
when you're dealing with stroker engines, anything with a long stroke, you're not going to be able to pull that paper gasket out of the gasket set and assemble the engine. So this is the stuff. It's yellow. They make it in a black, but don't use it. The, the yellow is what you want to get. And only put it on when you put the cylinders on and when you're going to torque the heads. Don't put it on the cylinders, stick the cylinders in the case and wait for a week before you torque the heads. It doesn't work good that way. And yeah, don't put your engine together with that either. No, do not. <laughs> I repeat, do not seal your case halves with this stuff. Don't put your oil pump in with it. Our Don't put it. your rear main seal in with it. This is a big no-no, okay? The only thing this is to be used for is at the base of the cylinders, okay? That or hold a rubber in your door or wherever else you might use one of them. This here is something we use and we like it very much. It comes with a, a brush. I'm going to get a close up on that. And take a look. It's a blue can. <clears throat> and uh, it's, uh, when you buy it, it's, it's practically impossible to get the top off. So you'll probably they have, couldn't get it off. <laughs> I got probably it have to. Uh, uh, yeah, well, this one's there, right. there it is. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyway, th this is very, very near, and it smells exactly like some stuff that we used to get from Germany. It's a Ford. It's a Ford. <laughs> I think I broke it. Built tough to stay tough. Right? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Good stuff. Good stuff. You can use a lot of other things. Gasket cinch, high tack. Um, what else could you use? Mm, Permatex. Permatex. A lot of things you can use. A lot I don't recommend. You know, I, I personally recommend this. I'm sure there's a Ford dealer in your town. Go there and buy this. You'll be happy you did. You could do everything but put your cylinders on with it. You know? Okay, I'm going to let Bill talk to you a minute about ignition systems. Yeah, let me get he out understands of the them a little better. And, uh, let me scoot out of here. Let me, let me trade places there. with him. He can go in there. And <laughs> okay, there's basically two type, There's three types of ignition systems made for Volkswagens today. The most common is the point type, normal, everyday, just like the one you have in your car. It doesn't have a vacuum advance, so on any kind of a high performance motor that you're doing, you're not going to need the vacuum advance. You're going to want a centrifugal advance. This is made by Bosch. It's a 009, probably the most common distributor on the market right now for a Volkswagen. There's another one made. It's made by Bosch. It comes out of Brazil. It's called the 050 Racing Distributor. It's almost identical in look, size, appearance, what it does and the way it works. As the 09, the curve is about one or two degrees different. It advances a little bit faster. But this is your cheapest, most economical, and in 90% of street cars and race cars, you will find one of these in it as far as it'll serve the purpose. Then you get into higher racing applications higher anything over about 7,000 RPM, RPM you'll you'll go this here is a stinger ignition it's a magnetic pickup comes with a little box because everything gets the it has a triggering device in here that goes to the box and that's what controls the spark to the wires and everything else this is what they call the electronic ignitions <clears throat> this isn't a CD unit it's just a magnetic pickup electronic ignition the other one that you see a lot on racing Volkswagens, prefer, well, just about always on a drag race application, is a Magneto. We don't have one here. They're getting phased out a little bit because of the cost. The Magnetos are getting very, very expensive. Uh, today, you would have probably $350 to $400 in a Magneto, where the Stinger ignition, which is probably the next best thing, I racing. wouldn't say the next best. Well, I'd say it's. I say it it's better. better. We've used it yeah. at the same time at the same track, within ten minutes of each other as it, a magneto. As a magneto, and the car never went faster. It never went slower. Right. It was cheaper to buy. Right. It was less troublesome when installed properly, and uh, had one advantage 
in the sense that we could install a retarding unit in our distributor that you couldn't do with well, a magneto. They, they, make a, they make their modules that hook onto this with retards built into them. We also put another set of pickups, a little magnetic pickup in here, which placed in here at the right position was five degrees retarded. And we could manually retard the ignition when we wanted to. And this unit is approximately $250. So it's a little bit cheaper than the magnetos. Magnetos just keep getting more and more expensive. Your common 09 and 050 and other, you know, point distributors run to anywhere from about $30 to $50, depending on what you're buying and where you're buying it. Mm -hmm. In any case, I don't, yeah. I don't think this distributor can be beat. For a street application. For a street application. If you're going to run that motor over 7,000 RPM, between 7 and up, and, and actually produce Constant. horsepower at 7,500 and 8,500, that distributor will not work. There's not enough spring tension mm -hmm. on the points. It'll go into point float, and nothing works at that point at all. For you old timers, according to Bosch, this 009, this one here made in Brazil, by the way, yeah. not coming out of Germany anymore. Uh, there's a few around yet, but according to Bosch, this is an exact copy of the old 010 distributor. Mm -hmm. According to Bosch, that's what they, they tell us. Uh, so for you old timers that say, well, I have an 010 and it might be better than that or whatever, according to Bosch, this is the same exact copy. The 010 was a mistake that Bosch made. It was a gigantic mistake. Mm -hmm. And they found a way to market it in Southern California right. by putting it in, in race cars. There's a long story connected with that. So uh, don't be afraid to get an 009 and stop looking around for 010s. I still get people who come to you me gotta and have say, an I gotta have an 010. Yeah. Gotta have one. Put things up in bulletin boards and everything. This is it right here. If you have an 010 or the 019, sure. they'll work just fine. Sure. Nothing wrong with them. But you can't get it anymore. Right. They're not, not readily anything. available. Parts for them are, if you do have them, you can still buy the, the points point condenser, condenser cap point. and rotors. But, but they're, not, yeah. they're not any better, so don't think they are. What have we missed? I don't know. I'm sure we've missed a dozen things. Now, now where did you hide the 92s? Uh, there's no 92s here. <laughs> Why don't we all on the count of three say boo 92 so that everybody <laughs> gets, gets, the, gets, the hint. gets the message once and for all. We've said it many, many times that we don't recommend 92s. All right. One, two, three. Boo, Boo 92. 92. Okay. They're, uh, <laughs> Once and for all. Much too thin a cylinder wall. You know. They had their day. You know, they changed so much over the years, too, from the time they were first introduced to the present. And people have got that stuck in their brain. They've got to run 92s. You know, there's that magic number 20, 2180. You know, the 92 piston, there was never anything wrong with it. You know. But they could never get it in a cylinder that stayed round, and that's why it didn't work. You know, had to have a puke can, a five-gallon can in the back. Well, you also the heard with the 92s is the racers would use them because that was big. Yeah. They could get more horsepower. And in a racing type, you don't run it very, very long or for very sustained. So it did last momentarily. It didn't last long enough, but it would last and it would make horsepower right out of the box. Mm -hmm. But after you've run it a few times, they'd start going away.